Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, I see we've got about 300 guests at the moment. Um, so we are, we've passed the 100 day mark since the first case of coronavirus was registered in South Africa. Uh, if any one of you are like me, we've, we've gone through the different waves of paranoia and then thinking maybe it won't be so bad and then realizing it is probably worse than we thought. We've probably doubled the household budgets for um, disinfectants and for hand sanitizer and for soap. And um, so today, just to provide some knowledge and to maybe uh, address some of the fears that we have about the shops and going to buy groceries and um, what if you bring the virus back home. We've got uh, Professor Lucia uh, Annelik who's joining us. She's got her own business, her own food consultancy. She's an expert in microbiology. She works in the food industry. And we're very happy and, and privileged to have her here. I must apologize due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, Dr. Juno Thomas from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases will not be able to join us um, today. Uh, so we apologize about that, but uh, Professor Annelik has got enough information and expertise for to, to keep us going for the next hour. So, um, Professor Annelik, I think maybe you can, can talk us through. We've spoken a little bit about this. This has been a uh, maybe a stressful time in the food industry since the beginning of the year. You guys have just come off listeriosis and then suddenly there was the next threat. So maybe you can just give us a little bit of an introduction about how you um, how you have been dealing with it since since January. Well, thank you very much, Estelle, and thanks for the um, for arranging this webinar. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry that Juno could not be here, so I'll do my best flying solo. Well, actually, um, at the end of January, I started communicating with the food industry about this potential threat that uh, would most likely uh, arrive on our shores as well, considering that it was starting to move across the world uh, in other countries and started looking into whether this in fact was a food safety threat um, um, as the listeriosis one clearly was um, and whether this was in fact a respiratory illness only uh, and if this virus could be uh, transmitted via food. And so from there onwards, it really just continued uh, the communication as, as much as I could get, I would then communicate with industry about it. But right from the get go, I indicated that it was not a food safety risk because we have no evidence that this virus is transmitted via food or indeed food packaging. And nothing has changed since then. That is still the stance. So maybe we can just take one little step back. So all of our social media feeds and and everywhere you turn and you listen and you watch, everyone's giving a biology lesson, but let's just get it from one of the experts. Maybe just a quick refresher on this the coronavirus, COVID-19 is the name of the disease, but it's caused by the coronavirus. So maybe you could just talk us through what does this uh, the public enemy looks like look like and and um, how what are the best ways to fight it? Well, um, this coronavirus uh, is very similar. Well, it's related to, if I can put it that way, to the first SARS virus that caused an outbreak in two thousand and three. It wasn't as uh, numerous as this one but it had a higher percentage of death rate than this current virus. Uh, but it did not infect the millions of people that we are seeing with this virus. The second one that occurred was in 2012, which was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS. 
And that virus was very localized in the Arabian Peninsula region. It only affected around two and a half thousand people, but uh, it had a very high mortality rate. Around 34% of the people who got it actually died from it. And then, of course, this one popped up last year in 2019, um, and it's called the SARS-CoV-2 to separate it or distinguish it from the first SARS virus. It's called a coronavirus, as the others have as well. And there are other coronaviruses. This is not the only one. There are human coronaviruses. There are animal coronaviruses. There, there's quite a lot of them. Um, and they have um, this, these little spikes or protein spikes around on the outside. And it, under the microscope, especially in particular, an, an electron microscope, it looks like a crown, hence the name corona. And this particular virus, which is really a blessing in disguise, is the fact that it has a fatty layer around on the outside. And this fatty layer makes it very susceptible to uh, certain conditions like soap. Soap disrupts that fatty layer, which means that soap is really effective when we wash our hands properly to actually kill the virus. And the same applies for normal household disinfectants. They work really well against this virus for that reason. If it didn't have this fatty layer, we would probably be faced with a more serious situation in terms of trying to get uh, rid of the virus. Okay, so there's hope that we can, um, this is not, not something that cannot be defeated. So I think maybe if you can just assist us, I think you have mentioned it a little bit. The first news we did here made a strong association between the virus and uh, animal products that were bought at the Wuhan wet market. But since then, the signs have moved on. This is now a virus that's transmitted from humans, not from animals to humans. Is that, is that correct? Well, um, the feeling is still that it originated from an animal because Animals uh, or animal viruses can sometimes jump host and jump to a human being. So they might have been milling around in a whole lot of uh, populations of different animals. And the indication is always towards bats. And this is also appears to be the indication in this case as well. There was talk originally about pangolins, but uh, from the research that I've seen, um, that doesn't seem to be uh, the current thinking. So yes, viruses can jump from animals to humans. Okay, so then let's get to the topic for today. You've said this before, we have no proof that you can get coronavirus by eating contaminated food. Maybe just um, talk us through why this is and also, Maybe if you can answer the first question, if will you eat just an apple that came from somewhere today without first disinfecting it? Right. Very good question. Um, so the, the, there are a number of food safety agencies across the world that are um, really very good at doing risk assessments. And um, I can name a few, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., uh, the French authorities, it's got a very long name, uh, just call it UNSIS for short. Uh, they did a very, very good early risk assessment, which they published on the 9th of March already, where they looked into various scenarios with food and potential transmission. And um, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland is another one, the Food Standards Agency of the UK, uh, Food Standards Australia New Zealand is another one, and they all concur um, that it isn't currently possible, we don't have the evidence that food transmits the virus. It might be present, but it doesn't transmit the virus mainly because the virus is a respiratory illness. So we don't have any um, evidence that the virus can be absorbed via the digestive tract. So okay. where some patients experience diarrhea, 
the, the belief is that it's actually the virus that was contracted via the respiratory airways that eventually becomes systemic in some patients, not all, and can affect the heart, uh, the liver, the kidneys, and potentially the intestines as well, which then might lead to diarrhea, not the other way around. So that okay. is, the, that is the, the current evidence that we have. On the eating the apple, absolutely. I um, come home with my shopping and I wash my fresh vegetables in fresh, clean water. And then I put them away and I use them as needed. I do not disinfect and I do not wash them with soap and water. That is a definite no-no. I know some people are doing that and I would really like to urge them not to do that because soap is toxic to humans. We are not designed to ingest soap and it can really have a harmful effect on us. Okay, so then if we, um, I think you've, you've touched on a little bit of this, so when we bring groceries home, I think there's a, a great amount of fear under people that, it, you know, when you, we all have to go out shopping or even if we get online shopping delivered, this is something coming from the outside to your house. Um, do you, is it sufficient to just wipe your groceries down with water or was, do you need to put a little bit of disinfectant in the water? What, what is the best way to do this when you've brought your groceries home? Right. So when I bring groceries home, I try to use cloth bags that are reusable simply because of the plastic issue in the oceans. And I'm trying not to contribute to that problem. Um, so I bring my groceries home. I wash my hands the moment I come into the house and I deposit the groceries. I then unpack the groceries, put them away. I do not disinfect and then go and wash my hands after I finish that process. And I find that to be perfectly adequate. In fact, the World Health Organization uh, has put out a notification and some infographics that are also clear on that. They do not suggest disinfecting everything that you receive. I then take those cloth bags and I rotate them so that I wash them just with normal um, wash uh, uh, soap that you would use in a washing machine and water. And then I have a second set that I can use the following day. Okay. So um, I think you've, you've touched on this a little bit, but when we look at food packaging then, what is the current research and tests being done to say the virus can live, say, on plastic, it can live on um paper, say carton boxes, uh, maybe you can just talk us through in the food industry, what are they looking at? Does this virus live on what type of, of, of um, packaging? So there has been some research done. Initially, we didn't have information for this virus. So uh, what we normally do in cases like that as scientists, we look at similar viruses and work and research that's been done on those. But interestingly enough, um, this particular virus, there was a publication earlier this year, I think it was in February of 2020, it could have been March, and it was published in the New England Medical Journal. And um, these researchers did work on the, the SARS Corona 2 virus, and they found under laboratory conditions, and I want to stress this, this is a controlled experiment which does not always reflect necessarily the, the normal practice in normal life. And in that controlled experiment, they found that the virus uh, survived for up to four hours on copper, for up to 24 hours on cardboard, and up to three days on plastic and stainless steel. What is very important, though, is to note that the, the, this work was done at a 40% humidity in the air and at uh, 21 to 23 degrees Celsius. So we know that this virus is susceptible also to drying out. So if the humidity in the air is less than 40%, the virus will likely not survive as long. But we also know that refrigeration and freezing for other viruses, we do not have data for this virus yet. But for other viruses, we do know that refrigeration and freezing actually prolongs survival. 
So it's it's really very much a, a balance of what to do under which circumstances. We also know that the virus does not fare well under higher temperatures, around 30, 32 and above. Okay, so I see there is some questions here about sunlight. Um, do you think it's worth putting, say, shopping bags or something like that, exposing or putting them in the sun to maybe just warm up a little bit after coming home from the shops? Yes, I, I certainly would suggest that. I do put my cloth masks sometimes in the sun for a few hours, but the question remains, how long does it have to be in the sun to have an effect? And that is not well known yet, but certainly a few hours uh, would probably be the minimum that one would have to expose them to the sunlight. Okay. So, and then um, just to recap, maybe the, the one thing that we need to understand is that while we can find the virus on things like plastic and cardboard, it doesn't multiply on these surfaces. Is that That's correct? Right. Yes. Okay. So. Yeah. So viruses, all viruses, not just the, the SARS-CoV-2, but even really proper foodborne viruses, none of them um, multiply outside of their host. So you've got plants that have plant viruses. You've got animals that have animal viruses. There are even bacteria that have viruses that infect bacteria. And you've got viruses that infect humans. And in all these cases, they do not grow outside of their host. So whatever number of viruses there may be present on any surface, they will either decrease or stay the same, but they cannot get more. So viruses only replicate or multiply in their hosts when they take over the cells and start to produce more virus. Okay. So just to take us a little bit back into um, the lockdown history, at first when we went into hard lockdown, there was a bit of an outcry and a furore and a lot of social media discussion about rotisserie chicken specifically, but also about hot cooked food. Um, and then it would be interesting, maybe if you can assist us, is, is a, was that ban a rational one at that stage? What, what were the risks involved? I don't know the reason why government stopped that, but I can only speculate. I don't believe it was necessarily because government thought it was a food safety risk. I think that it was probably more likely the fact that if a certain retailer is providing rotisserie chicken, for example, or cooked pies uh, at their little deli counter. There are many other stores like real, you know, pie shops that would only uh, sell pies in their stores and nothing else. They were not allowed to trade. So then the question would arise, but if, if that store can provide uh, hot pies at the deli section, within a retail store selling other products that we are allowed to buy, then why can't I open up my pie shop and sell pies to the public? And I think it was more from that perspective that uh, it was disallowed. Okay. So the, um, so it wasn't that rotisserie chicken was more risky than any no, other type I, of food? <laughs> I don't believe that was the case, no. Okay. So then I think my next question is if um, – if you want to protect yourself and your family, uh, what disinfectants is, is, would you suggest this is, um, would be the most successful against the virus? Well, there are some disinfectants that we know work very well. 70% alcohol is one of them. So therefore, your hand sanitizer that you would normally get in the stores these days is perfectly adequate for that. You can even wipe down surfaces with a 70% alcohol. Um, but what also works very well is a 0.1% household bleach solution, 0.1%. So what does that mean? Our bleach that we normally buy in the stores in South Africa has about 3.5% sodium hypochlorite in it. So you need to dilute it from 3.5% to get a 0.1% dilution. And that is one part to 34 parts. So one part bleach to 34 parts of water. So if it's a cup of bleach, then it's 34 cups of water. 
If it's a teaspoon of bleach, it would be 34 teaspoons of water that you would then mix and that would give you your 0.1 percent. Okay and that would be, I mean that is a fairly simple and affordable way to to clean your surfaces in the house, in the refrigerators and, and so on. Exactly okay. and uh, you need about one minute exposure time to that disinfectant to actually have some effect of kill. Okay and does it make a difference if the water is hot or cold? That no you... difference whatsoever. No, it's the actual bleach. In fact, you don't want it to be hot because um, there are certain chloride molecules that are no longer effective at high temperatures. So you don't want hot water in this case because you might actually be um, doing the opposite in terms of, you know, uh, having an effect on, on the actual virus itself. So tepid water or uh, cold water would be just perfect. Okay. So now if we can turn to the shops and how safe our shops are, that, that's where you might do most of your work. Yeah. Uh, maybe just a few words about what I think experts are calling safe environments. I think that our president repeated as well, and sanitizer, masks, social distancing. Is this the, the sort of common wisdom that you are also your starting point for, for fighting the virus inside shops and food establishments as well? Absolutely. Um, the if I can just take washing of hands as an example, washing hands for 20 seconds, which is singing happy birthday twice, is something that we've been teaching and preaching to the food industry for decades. So you will find that in food manufacturing, this has been going on for, for, for a very, very long time. Um, so those kind of practices, we know they work against most bacteria and viruses. So it, it just remains a really good hygiene practice to do that. And transferring it into the home and into a restaurant environment or in a retail environment makes perfect sense because we know it works. The same now for face masks because it's now become a requirement to wear face masks. And there is evidence that um, certain size droplets are held back by a face mask. A face mask, and especially the ones we wear commonly in public, the cloth masks and so on, don't necessarily uh, prevent all droplets from being uh, exposed or being distributed, but certainly does help to keep them back to some extent. And that is why face masks are, uh, are, are required. But what also goes hand in hand with that is the correct handling of the face masks. So one needs to understand the hygienic way of putting them on, the correct way of wearing them, so that they cover your nose and your mouth, not just the mouth, and then the nose uh, carries on, you know, is exposed. Um, not putting them on your head, you know, wearing them like sunglasses or those kind of practices is, is really not helpful. And then also when you take them off, there's also a hygienic uh, protocol that should go hand in hand with doing that. Okay, so I think we've seen that our um, cashiers in the shops and people who are working in the big food chains and elsewhere as well, they have been wearing masks. Uh, as a consumer, what what are you? Uh, what are your options? Say if you do find a cashier, it's maybe it's a little bit late in the day and the mask is up here at the or the face, the, the shield is, is being worn like an Alice band. Um, obviously, I think there, there's no need. What is it that we are supposed to do? Is this a, do we just point it out? Or, or how do we, I mean, clearly the consumer has a right to a safe shopping environment. Correct. And then, so what is it for consumers to do if they, if they see something going wrong? I think it's everyone's responsibility to point these things out to management. And there's usually a manager uh, on call in the stores that one can then ask to speak to if you can't see the person directly, or if they're behind a small little cubicle, then you go directly to them and address the situation in a calm uh, manner and just say, this is what I've observed and um, I'm concerned about that and I'd appreciate it if you would deal with it. Okay, and the, the safety protocol when it comes to the wiping of surfaces, 
Um, I've read some of the uh, protocols that say services must ideally be wiped between customers. Um, and so how often would you say, is it, would it be safe to say if there's a little bakery where people stand to order food or bread or something, or even the till um, where, you, where you buy things, should those things be wiped between different customers? It is good practice to do that. I think it also depends on the volume of traffic and how often, you know, people come past that point or would put their hands on that point. Uh, so, yes, they, I think every store would have to develop their own protocol in terms of how frequently they would then disinfect those um, surfaces in a retail store. In a, in a food manufacturing environment, uh, there are protocols in place as well. And that depends, again, on the number of staff that you have in an environment. So if you're a small business uh, with five or 10 people, then that protocol might look slightly different. Whereas if you have a, a large manufacturing company and you've got three, 400 people on site at any one time, then you would wish people definitely to wash their hands and sanitize them far more frequently. Okay, so, and then I see this is the question that's come through on the credit card machines, you know, the um, the little machines with the card and the pins and the everything. I, I, we very seldom see those being wiped down, but clearly they can also be a contaminated surface, a very contaminated surface. Definitely. And what I do is I insert my credit card, I put my pin number in with a specific finger, and then I'm very, and then I ask the ladies behind the till usually to just spray some disinfectant on those fingers and then I wipe them down myself before I then uh, touch anything else. So I'm very, I'm very careful on, uh, of doing that. Um, I also uh, noticed that in some cases they give you a pen with which to sign something. And I also decline to use the pen and I rather take my own pen out my handbag and use my own pen to sign with. It's just, it's just those hygienic practices that are really important and could really help tremendously to prevent transmission of this virus. Yes, I think um, it's very much a behavior change for all yeah. of us that, that really need it. So if we can maybe turn a little bit to, I think we've all seen it when the big shopping market or even small shops, when somebody has tested positive for the virus, we have seen the shop being closed and for disinfection. Now, yes. I, don't think, I don't think a lot of us know, except for the cleaning companies, what happens when they disinfect the shop. I mean, do they just spray it? Or maybe you could just talk us through what is this infection, even if there's a big food manufacturing um, company that this happens to? Or what, what are the, what? Estelle? Well, I'll just carry on in case um, everybody else can hear me. So the disinfection occurs um, very often from a, a separate company that sometimes is called into the manufacturing sector and the company itself would then come in with the appropriate uh, protective equipment, wearing the correct uh, equipment and with certain chemicals that they would do a deep cleaning of the area and of the factory um, and then after it depends on again the type of product that it, that's, that's being produced and also the local municipal laws because in environmental health practitioners should come in and um, they would then typically inspect the facilities and agree to reopen that particular uh, manufacturing environment or retail store and there is also a specific way in which to handle all the waste material that would uh, occur from this particular deep cleaning. There would be overalls, there would probably be aprons, there would be other facial protective equipment. So that also has to be dealt with in a very careful way because it is um, it should be treated as medical waste. Uh, and so there's a specific protocol for um, handling medical waste. So that is typically what would happen in those environments. I think Estelle had some other questions um, related to um, 
disinfecting those environments. Um, and so grocery stores would do that. When you find a COVID positive uh, person, there is also a protocol required by law as to how that store or manufacturing sector factory would then handle that uh, person. That person is immediately isolated, uh, put in a separate room, provided with a higher level mask so that that person is restricted in terms of how he or she uh, could spread the virus. Um, there would be testing requested uh, this person's uh, test would be reported, etc. So there's a whole protocol in place that those stores would have to follow if a COVID-19 uh, positive individual is found. So I'm looking at the questions that um, Estelle was planning to ask me before we lost her. Um, In terms of the restaurant uh, returning to opening, hopefully very, very soon, uh, there have been a lot of questions around what should restaurants be doing. Now, typically, uh, there are various things that are similar in some respects to what uh, the food manufacturing sector would be doing. Obviously, one of them is masks. Um, I have seen some suggestions that people should be wearing both face masks and uh, uh, the face shields because the shield actually protects the eyes and there is some research coming out now that is showing that uh, quite a high percentage of um, infections occur via the eyes. So a facial shield is possibly something that could also be considered. Furthermore, um, putting tables a certain distance from one another where one can move tables around would work really, really well. Where tables are stationary and cannot be moved around, it would be useful to then have them uh, separated in terms of a table used and a certain number of tables around that one not being used. Uh, so there are various things that one can put in place and we will be, we'll have to wait for the regulations and um, the recommendations that will come from government in terms of uh, the restaurant industry. Hello, Ansu. Hello, nice. thank you. Um, you. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry my worst nightmares come true and the standing <laughs> person has to step in. Um, no problem. You, Ralph, I'm sorry, I missed your last three minutes as I was, I was um, trying to get in. Were you discussing how you can make restaurants safe? Uh, yes, I was. Down restaurants? That's right, I started talking about that. Would you like Excellent. me to continue? Yes, continue, and then I can right. gather my thoughts. Okay. So hand sanitizers are really important as well in a restaurant environment. So uh, before you enter the restaurant, there should be hand sanitizing made uh, mandatory at the entrance to the restaurant. Um, the layouts, obviously, I mentioned the movement of tables and ensuring appropriate distances between the different tables. Um, there are some countries that have put up perspex um, walls around various tables, uh, especially for those that are um, now dining outside, that can dine outside in the uh, summer months. And that's actually really looking good, where they protect the, the, the people inside that particular little, little booth, if you like. And it's transparent, so you can see outside. Um, obviously, keeping distance uh, from waiters and waiters keeping their distance from the patrons, all of that is, is part of the process. And and what about what about delivery? So we've got a you know what what has happened out of need is 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 a lot of restaurants um, food industries have started delivering. What are some of the things they can do to make that really safe um, for all of us? Well, those deliveries are um, usually hot food, sometimes salads, but they need to keep them closed and covered so that uh, there's no potential trans, uh, transmission of the virus in any way from the, from the during the transportation process. Um, it is also very good just general food safety practice that uh, the, the, the container in which those boxes of food are uh, uh, 
put in for transportation, the actual transport vehicle as well, whether it's a little motorbike with a carrier at the back or something like that. It is just good food safety practice to keep all of those very well cleaned and disinfected. Um, so this is something um, that has been um, not of concern, but certainly brought under the spotlight uh, even prior to the COVID-19 issue. Thank you. Estelle, you're back. We, we have a, we have a three-way conversation, so please jump in. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, um, can I maybe just take this opportunity? How would you extrapolate some of the safety measures you are discussing and in terms of schools? Schools are starting to reopen. Uh, universities are starting to reopen. Um, how, how would you use what you know from the food safety point of view in those kind of settings? Well, from a food safety perspective, it is really not an issue. So um, if there is a canteen on site, then the normal food safety practices, food hygiene practices would be just as applicable in this particular situation. Um, besides the fact that people will be wearing masks, social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, that would be par for the course. And in terms of surfaces, are there a lot of shared surfaces? I'm thinking about desks, I'm thinking about lecture halls, which is almost a lot of issues that you would have to address in a kind of a food industry. What would be some of your suggestions around making those safe? Well, that is about cleaning the, and disinfecting those surfaces on a regular basis. So the, the protocols that the schools um, and the universities, for that matter, would have to put in place would be regular cleaning and disinfection to ensure that there's no transfer from person to person in those environments. Right, Estelle, over to you. Oh, I think we've lost Estelle again. Okay, well, well, let's continue. Prof, um, do you think government is really consulting with the food industry? Do you think there's been enough speaking to people? Okay, I think we've got a few interesting questions from um, our listeners. So, um, one. Oh. Anzu, I can't hear you. Sorry, you're, I can't hear you now. You are there very involved in food safety issues. What what are you satisfied in how the role players have been consulted about by government in terms of making some of the decisions they've made? I I do believe there's been very good consultation. Um, I don't think that the requirements that governments have put in place um, are onerous. I think it is very very similar to what we see elsewhere in the world. Uh, in fact, to be honest, I think our government uh, was far more proactive than some other governments like, for example, in the United States, where in one uh, pork producing plant, over 250 workers were found to be positive for COVID-19. Um, uh, so, so, you know, there should have been a lot of um, prevention already put in place before those people actually became infected. So our industry has really been very proactive in um, putting those measures in place, even before there were regulations promulgated by government in that regard. Thank you. Prof, there's a question around gloves. So gloves is, have been quite a contentious issue. Are they good, are they bad, especially with people preparing food and working with the food before it gets handed over to us? And then also, if you could flip it, I see a lot of people doing this gloves and i'm wondering if that is a if that is good practice or not gloves are not a very good way of dealing with covid 19 in a normal food environment um we're not talking now in hospital environments where there's infection and so on so let's separate the two gloves are unfortunately very often a false sense of security and we know by research that over many many years that people, when they wear gloves, they tend to forget that the glove is an extension of their hands, in fact. And so they will touch surfaces with the gloves and then touch their faces or 
forget to wash their hands because they've got gloves on. So we know that hand washing regularly is far more effective than wearing gloves, both in a food preparation environment as well as a, a shopping uh, individual that's doing shopping, that's touching different surfaces, maybe touching their face, touching their eyes without thinking about it because they've got the glove on and therefore it, it provides this false sense of security. So that is a big concern. I hope this is a fair question um, also. Uh, supermarket trolleys, baskets, are they, would, would you, if you were a manager of a supermarket, would you want somebody to be wiping those down constantly or do you think that's not good use of, of resources and people's time? No, definitely. That is one of the um, uh, measures that we that are in place. You do need to wipe down trolley handles and basket handles. And the supermarkets I've been to, at any rate, do have the sanitizer uh, wipes that you have in a dispenser that you pull out and you can do your own sanitizing, which work very well. Sorry, I can't hear you, Answer, so I've lost you. Sorry, I'm starting to look at some of the go. questions here. Yes. And, and so people are asking spectacles, safety glasses, are, are those a good practice to go out with those when you go shopping, when you go, maybe go to a restaurant? Would you, would you recommend that? Safety glasses versus spectacles? Um, well, spectacles, some people have to wear, like me, otherwise I can't see where I'm going. Um, but a specific uh, uh, glass covering or uh, sports glasses or something like that, one can certainly wear those. What we need to just be vigilant of is that on the sides and the top, they are open. So um, if it helps to wear something that prevents you from constantly rubbing your eyes, then yes, it certainly could help. Uh, am I on or off? I'm on, I think. Can you, you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, there's also been, I, I've read quite a lot of articles from overseas and there was there was a sense that um, people should disinfect their shoes uh, when they've been outside, when they've walked because of, of how the virus, uh, it's droplets, they fall to the to the surface, people walk across it. What is, what is your take on that? Um, well, the World Health Organization has come out very recently with um, a statement on that, and they find that it is not transmissible in that way. And therefore, you know, going around in the streets and disinfecting the roads and the streets is really not useful at all. Um, so, no, it, it's, it's, it's not regarded to be uh, a problem in terms of, you know, wearing shoes and walking around. Thank you. You you are you are now being um, you're on the receiving end of a lot of questions. So thank you. I'm going to keep going with the questions that are coming from the people who are listening in. Patting other people, patting your dog. Would you? People are obviously worried. They go out into the park. Someone uh, rubs um, your dog, and then you go away and you touch your dog again. Is is that is that okay? Is that safe? Or, or should you should you be wiping your dog down when you get home? No. That is safe. There's no indication at all that uh, patting a dog uh, is, is a way of transmitting the virus. Thank you. Um, I, I went out yesterday and I think in about five stores I had my temperature taken and I've read articles where that's actually quite risky for the person taking the temperature because they get quite close to people, uh, less so than us who are on the receiving end. But also the jury is out whether, whether that's necessarily a good measure. What what would your take be on that? Well, you know that the reason for taking temperatures and writing down your name on a list to say you've entered the stores, it's all about trying to prevent uh, people who might be showing a fever from entering into the store and potentially contaminating others. So the food industry, the manufacturing sector is definitely uh, taking temperatures of all their workers every single morning when they come to work. Uh, it is by law a requirement now in, in, in any case. So that is that is definitely done. Um, what one could do as an additional precaution for the person taking the temperature is to have that person wearing a face shield as well as a mask to try and provide almost double protection for that individual. And I think what they also need to do is to make sure that their own hands are sanitized frequently. 
quite a thank you. Um, hand sanitizer on little children. I also read an article where there's a fire risk. Um, it's it's dangerous in terms of if children had to get close to an open fire or a gas stove. But is it is it safe? It's quite a strong solution. What what would your what would your advice be for little ones? Well, um, I think the best would be to always um, observe while they are sanitizing their hands so that you are always present as an adult. Um, and I think that's probably the best precaution because they do really need to also uh, be part of this whole hand sanitize, sanitization process. So using the 70% alcohol-based sanitizing gels um, is really very effective, but they would need some supervision. Thank you. Uh, Prof, there, there's, a, there's a few questions around money and handling of money, and I'm sorry if you covered it while I was trying to get into the room. Um, could you, if you have answered it, could you repeat what, what would your take be on the handling of money, especially when you, you've bought food or whatever and you, you're not using a credit card but cash? What, what would your suggestions be around those? Again, it's a question of handling the money, handing it over, and then sanitizing your hands directly after that. Um, because I think there is a negligible risk that yeah. there might be transmission with paper money in particular. Mind you, even the coins possibly, considering that the virus can survive for some time on those kind of surfaces. But I don't believe it's a, it's a, it's a very big risk. But certainly hand sanit sanitizing straight after handling that money would be very appropriate. Thank you. Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll, I'll let the expert answer it. Someone's asking, you know, they're going back to the workplace. There are air, there's air conditioning. There's less uh, fresh air moving. A um, lot of office blocks don't have open windows. Um, can you give people a little bit more information on what your, your take is on that? Well, there's been a lot of talk about whether this virus is uh, able to be aerosolized, in other words, moving via aerosol in the air and not just the large droplets. And I think there is consensus that this virus is not aerosolized in a normal working environment. It's a different situation in the healthcare environment in an ICU where you've got a number of these patients all shedding high levels of the virus. So let's again exclude that group. Um, so th the general consensus is that it is distributed via the large droplets that drop to the ground within about a meter of the person who's expelling those droplets. So um, the air con doesn't seem to be a problem uh, as far as we know. And uh, we, we're moving further away from your, your, your absolute expertise, which is food. Um, but I think a lot of the rules apply no matter what. So people saying sport, they're handing tennis balls, sharing tennis balls. So they are saying non-contact sport is allowed. Maybe a rugby ball where it's in your hands. Um, would you also say the risk is negligible when it comes to that? I would, um, although we don't have a lot of evidence around that. But um, to be on the safe side, possibly before a match and after a match, one could certainly look at disinfecting the surfaces of those balls that have been handled. I think it's just a precautionary measure, which is probably something that one could follow. So, Prof, will you be going to a restaurant soon? Will you be going to sit down in a restaurant and enjoying a meal? And, and maybe just take people through again, what are some of the precautions if people choose to do that? What, what can they do? Um, and then maybe flip it. What what would you expect as a minimum from a from a food safety point of view? Uh, restaurants should be doing. Well, I, I would um, sort of observe the restaurant and what they do as I sort of approach it. I would want to have sanitizer at the door that I am sprayed with on my hands. I think we need to talk about disinfection booths as well because I think that's a, a really contentious issue. Um, and certainly um, being shown to a table that is separated from other tables and that there's some visible measure of keeping patrons apart from each other. Um, I would want to see how the um, waiters are acting and reacting to various situations, 
what hygienic practices do they follow in front of me that I can actually see. So typically them sanitizing their hands. Um, there are restaurants that are looking at uh, providing paper menus that are then disposed of after you've touched them instead of having the plastic menus which people then touch and have to be constant, constantly then sanitized uh, every single time they hand the menu to somebody else. So there are a number of um, uh, things that restaurants can actually do to make it safe for, for, for people to go and dine there. Thanks. And, and people are really wanting you to spend a bit more time on the disinfection booth. Now, there's a lot right. that's been said on it, and maybe you can just reiterate um, what, what your thinking is around it. So right from the start, when these disinfection booths started to sort of show up, um, a number of pamphlets that I received advertising these booths, I started to investigate, uh, first of all, the standards that they claimed they were uh, complying with. And some of them were named South African national standards. Others named um, some EU standards that they were complying with. But none of them actually said what the disinfectant was that they were going to use because in most cases it's proprietary information. So they wouldn't be happy to share it with anybody else. And I did some investigation into those standards and in a few cases, the standards they claimed they complied with did not exist. And um, in other cases, the standards were not relevant to a disinfectant that you are spraying on a person. They were relevant to disinfectants that you would apply to surfaces and objects and not live tissue. So this is a real uh, area of concern. So my feeling right from the start was that these booths were really not necessary and could potentially be of a greater danger to human health. I was very pleased when the World Health Organization uh, published a statement on the 16th of May around these disinfection, disinfectant booths. And they say there that under no circumstances should people be sprayed with disinfectant. And it wasn't long after that that the medical uh, apologies, I think it's the Ministerial Advisory Committee to the Department of Health also came out with a statement corroborating exactly that, that the disinfection booths, um, the rationale behind wanting to spray people, first of all, with the disinfectant is just not there. So never mind the type of disinfectant, whether it could be damaging to one's health or not, just simply the rationale of wanting to do that is not based on evidence at all. And so these disinfection booths um, are a great concern to many of us. And the president even uh, addressed this the other evening when he announced the relaxation around restaurants and hairdressers and, and, and salons, etc., opening up again. Thanks. Um Prof, they, they're telling me we should wrap up, and, and but there's one burning question that keeps coming back, and maybe you can just touch on it again. People are asking in what situation should they shower and, and, and wash their clothes? Where would you say are high-risk areas when you go to a hospital? Should you come back and wash your clothes? I think you've said that, that coming back from shopping, um, but maybe you can just touch on that again, and then and then we will wrap up. Thank you. So I think mainly when in a hospital environment where there's a high risk for this uh, kind of transmission, yes, clothes would need to be taken off in a particular area before you enter into the rest of the home, for example, have a shower and then put clean clothes on and, and put those clothes into a, a plastic bag or a separate basket of some sort and then have them washed separately as well. Um, under normal circumstances, going shopping, coming home, that is really not needed. Um, um, and so that, that would be my advice. Thank you. Do you have a burning addition? Anything else you'd want to share with, uh, with the many people that are listening to you? I think we've said so much. I um, think we've covered probably everything that uh, we could do in about an hour. But one thing I do want to say is that, um, uh, you know, just generally being aware 
uh, practicing safe food handling practices at home under any circumstance is a good thing. Um, and also wearing masks in the correct manner, frequently washing hands in the correct way. These relatively simple practices actually go a long way to protecting us against this virus and against any other potential foodborne bacteria or viruses that might be out there. Thank you so much. And um, again, apologies for the technical hitches. Um, those are par for the course. They, they yeah. always happen and make life interesting. But thank you for being so such a pro about it and just continuing to, to host the webinar. Um, um, but thank you, everyone who tuned in. This is live journalism, and we appreciate your engagement and patience. And we will uh, take note of all your questions and, and ask the prof to help us to respond to as many of them as we can. And there will be a write-up of this webinar being uh, published in the next few days. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Stay safe. You too. Thank you.